Well, good. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, well, good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to everyone here um, joining us at, at the Royal Drawing School and also online um, on our live stream. I'm, I'm Claudia Tobin, and I run the Royal Drawing School's lecture series and conversation series. And we're, we're really delighted to be uh, hosting tonight's event, celebrating the life and work of the extraordinary artist uh, Paula Rego. And it's a real pleasure to be uh, partnering with the Royal Society of Literature um, as tonight's conversation really brings together uh, the focus of our two institutions on art and on literature. And so we'll be exploring uh, Paula Rego's legacy as a captivating storyteller and tracing the ways in which she took inspiration from literature and in turn influenced literary culture. For those watching online, um, we're gathered here uh, in the Royal Drawing School studios uh, which were full of artists um, just before our, our audience arrived. Um, and so there's still the, the dust of, of charcoal in the air and hopefully a sense of the magic of, of making pictures and, and drawing stories, um, which we hope uh, Paula Rego would have approved of. Uh, so Paula Rego um, described um, how she would put a, a story into a picture. And throughout her life, she drew sustenance from fairy tales, from folk tales, novels, poetry, often unearthing the female uh, perspectives in a narrative. Her paintings are animated by and even, even haunted by different characters from myth, literature, even cartoons, from Walt Disney to Thomas Hardy to Charlotte Bronte. But they are always transformed under her brush and given a life of their own in her paintings. So to bring Paula Rego's life uh, and literary li influences um, to life for us this evening, we've got this wonderful panel of, of speakers uh, joining us. Um, and they include both uh, artists uh, practicing both uh, visual art and, and literary, the literary arts. So I'd like to welcome our, our speakers and introduce them to our audience in a bit more uh, detail. Welcome, welcome to you all. Thank you. So uh, we begin with Anthony Rudolph, who was Paula Rego's companion and principal male model for 26 years um, until her death in 2022. Anthony is an autobiographer, a poet, a literary critic, an editor, and a translator. His memoirs include Silent Conversations, A Reader's Life, and The Arithmetic of Memory. And his books of poems and short fiction include Zigzag and European Hours. He's translated works of fiction and short fiction, uh, drama, art criticism, poetry, and published pioneering uh, anthologies of contemporary French poetry and 20th century Jewish poetry from all languages. Anthony is also the founder of Maynard Press, which he ran for 40 years. He's a Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres and fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the English Association. Joining Anthony, we have uh, and we welcome two artists from the Royal Drawing School's faculty. They'll be sharing their perspectives on, on Paul Rego. So first, uh, Susan Wilson, uh, who is a New Zealand-born painter who studied at Campbell School of Art and the Royal Academy and was a fellow of, paint, fellow of painting at Cheltenham and Gloucester College of Art and Technology. Susan has taught at Chelsea School of Art and Wolverhampton University and she's exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition and Lynn Painter Stainers, as, as well as many other exhibitions. And her work is included in, in collections uh, ranging from the Royal Academy Usher Gallery to Murray Edwards College, Cambridge, to the Auckland Museum in New Zealand. And I know that uh, Susan visited Paula Rego's uh, in her studio and discussed painting um, with her in depth. So, so we look forward to hearing more about that. Now we turn to fellow painter, Julie Held, uh, who similarly to Susan studied at Camberwell uh, and the Royal Academy Schools. Julie has exhibited widely in group exhibitions, including at the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, the London Group Annual Exhibition, the Barbican, um, and the BP Portrait Award, as well as internationally. And her work is held in public collections um, at Nathal College, Oxford University, Ben Urie Arts Society Collection, and Newhall, Cambridge. 
Julie's an elected member at the RWS, the London Group, and the NEAC, winning the Doreen McIntosh Prize in 2011. So now to draw us back uh, towards literature, uh, we welcome Helen Kwa, who is a poet and doctor whose uh, work has appeared in uh, journals such as the Rialto, uh, Prototype, and the Poetry Review. Her debut pamphlet, Dog Woman, was published uh, last year in June and considers the work of Paula Rago as a backdrop to exploring themes of womanhood and ornamentalism. For this book, she received uh, a 2023 Eric Gregory Award, and we look forward to hearing uh, Helen read from her, um, her pamphlet uh, later this evening. So thank you all uh, to our speakers for joining us. Um, and just to remind our audience um, that we will have time for questions later, um, so keep those bubbling away and um, we'll give time for those at the end of the conversation. But welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. That's really. Um, when I've read my or spoken my piece, I'm, I'm morphing into the chairman. But that's why I'm going first, because it might be much easier for me to be two different people if I've, if I've done my panelists' uh, speech first. And I'll try and make sense of what are not mere uh, bullet points, but kind of, but not totally scripted either. Okay, it's really, a, I'm going to talk about, there's a million subjects, but the, the one I, I'm going to concentrate on is reading and literature and books, especially books in her life, which were vital. She adored books. She was not the philosophical or systematic intellectual like, say, the painter Kitai, or, or, the, or her late husband Vic, who would, who, who, who for whom, for Paula, reading was, uh, she was a voracious reader for its own sake, and always looking for what she called story, not the story, but she was always looking for story, often consciously, but not always. For more than two years, when she was frail at the end of her life, I read poetry to her every night. Eliot, Auden, Keats, and she would join in very important. She always had a book though of her own to read and on the last day of her life she had Keats poems and letters by her bed and and we read I read to her on on the night she died. Um, poetry I think created a kind of safe space in the latter years. It was almost more than painting and music and movies. It was English language poetry, not Portuguese. She read the poems by friends of hers, but she'd gone to, the thing is, she'd gone to an English school in Portugal, and they studied, I worked it out, and then I found on her shelves, The Golden Treasury, because she knew all these poems off by heart, and some of them I did as well. Um, we'd, we'd, we'd had a, quite a similar, curiously, a similar upbringing in, in English literature. She had this lifelong lo love of English poetry, and then there was fiction. Now, fiction, and folklore that could be Portuguese, um, English, lang English language, and Portuguese fiction, and books like uh, Boragine's Life of the Saints, Bible, and so on. Her father, her, she was the only child, as is well known. Her father introduced her to his favorite novelist, Essa de Queiroz, and she did um, illustrations. It's the wrong word because you can't pinpoint which page. That the, the the image goes with that she she let's call them illustrations for the moment her her contribution to the novel what would be uh, could would would be the spirit of the story and that she would colonize the book of course with her own her own concerns um, and the, her house in Portugal and her flat in London full of books not only poetry and fiction but art books she was very learned in art history. Um, it's not often talked about. People talk about her, her um, debt to folklore and and so on. But the the art books, the art history, and um, and I know this because when we went on our annual holiday to a city where there were there would always be lots of pictures, Venice, Florence, you name it, uh, I got an education in a visual education. It was a kind of privilege to be. To not just be her model, but to be to learn about looking such a verbal person um, at 
I, in return, I, to some extent, I could um, expand her horizons in poetry and bring her up to date because her favourites, quite rightly, were the canonical poets like Auden, Yeats, Keats, Matthew Arnold, um, Wordsworth. Almost predictable, but there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's it's the best. But there were there were modern contemporary poets who I thought she should read, and she did too. So that was fun. And um, writers loved her. And usually they, as a quote unquote, went first. In other words, she would find the text and and then go with it, do it. But sometimes it was the other way around. They would they would they would seek her out, and um, the, the the image would could be first. Um, Nigella Lawson brought her a story. That, that's an example of Stone Soup, which in the end she withdrew the story for reasons one can only speculate. I have a theory, but I'm not going to I'm not going to say what it is. And in the end, Paula's daughter wrote the story, and and. Um, then there's Martin Madonna, one of the great talk. Uh, um, someone can shut me up, and I've used up my time. Uh, the the the. I don't know how many of you saw Pillow Man, and if mm -hmm. you didn't see the play, you may know Paula's remarkable pictures. Which was the first time she used um, mannequins. We went to see this wonderful, wonderful play at uh, National Theatre, and they made contact. Paula made contact with him typically, because she often wrote to writers for a story. And they didn't always say yes, or they didn't always succeed in finding one to, for her. But Martin Madonna, um, she did Pillow Man, and he returned the compliment because her, her, her images were used in the, in the promotion of his show of when it went broad Broadway. And later he sent her his stories, and she did some wonderful pictures and stories which have never been published. My, my theory is that they've never been published because they're not very good stories. But that doesn't matter. They were compost for him. And he made his plays out of them. But Paula um, uh, made some wonderful pictures. I, I know, I can see now the, the gloves with, with, with these kind of creepy crawlies on them. Um, then covers. She did covers, occasionally did covers for books. Or people would ask permission to use an image on the cover. Um, but we come to the ekphrastic poems, the, the people who wrote poems. Um, it's an old tradition. I'm not quite sure when the word came in, but ekphrastic is a poem about a painting. It's an ancient tradition. And so many people have um, um, written poems about her, about, about her, based on her pictures. And uh, um, then sometimes she would find the text that she wanted to do, Adelia Lopez in Portugal, Blake Morrison, Augustus Young, Tabucci, just discover the story by Tabucci, which is lifts, uh, rises out of one of Paula's images. Um, we all know, or, or I guess most people here know that Paula did the Brontes, um, Jane Eyre. In fact, the White Sargasso Sea, the prequel to Jane Eyre. That was one of, and I'm, this is Mr. Rochester here, so I know it's what, what, <laughs> what, that was not very comfortable posing on a silicone horse <laughs> from the B, from BBC props. But, but um, and then uh, we often talked about her rescuing from history, uh, poor old Branwell Bronte, whom I, I had, had a, a great fascination. She read Daphne du Maurier's biography of, of Branwell. And the very last time she sketched me um, was I was posing as Branwell. All you need is a prop, which is a bottle. And, and um, uh, then I, I want to say something about the, the role of the commission in uh, in artists' life. Um, she had two sublime inspired commissions from the National Gallery. One was Crivelli, uh, it's on the screen, um, when she was the artist in residence. She um, 
of the altar piece, the Crudelli altar piece, inspired, and she put her friends into it. I, I'm not in it, partly because I hadn't met her yet, which is a good explanation. And, and the other National Gallery, um, magnificent um, uh, um, pairing was when the curator, Richard Morfitt, uh, curated this exhibition called Encounters, when 24 artists were invited. It was, I think it may have been the 200th anniversary of the National Gallery, which was Paula's second favorite museum in the world. Probably, yes, her favorite, Prado. Uh, so National Gallery, Richard Morfitt suggested to the artists, or perhaps they, I don't think anyone suggests to Lucy and Freud what he should do, but the artist chose a Freud chose Chardin, and Paula chose, uh, uh, Rich, Richard Morfitt suggested to Paula, who's very suggestible and always looking for writing, writes to, used to write to writers for stories. Um, and he suggested Mariage à la Motte, Hogarth's sequence. Um, and I, again, I, I know well what, what it, it was about because I was the errant husband who, whom you know from, uh, from, from uh, uh, um, Hogarth, but you may well know from her her her, her marvelous marvelous triptych. In fact, I, I'm I'm in five five pose. I think it's no three or four poses in in, in the picture, in different pictures. Um, another another. Um, she she didn't just derive um, inspiration from from books, although she did that more than most painters, I suspect. And when you said earlier, someone said brush. I, I almost never saw her use a brush. She was by the time I came on the scene, she was into this spectacular use of pastel, mm -hmm. which which she and her friend and my friend Kitai, I think, were the the two great pastel artists since Degas, that the painter both of them admired and worshipped, and I, I learned to do the same. Um, the uh, turning point I want to mention is that we went to an exhibition at, yes, what I'm trying to say is that painters draw on other painters more and are more open about it than writers are. That's a, it's a subject in its own right. Um, Writers quite often won't admit there, and then they get into a mess because if they'd admitted it, no one would have minded. Ian McCoon once published a grovelling apology for using the structure of sort the Hardy novel or or some some famous novel, Tristan Shandy, perhaps, but whatever it was, he when he was quote unquote found out that he had reinvented it. He made a, a great new novel. He hadn't. Um, uh, um, mm. He wasn't plagiarizing. He kind of behaved as though he was plagiarizing. Mm. Whereas mm. one of the things I love about painters in general um, is that how honest they are about about their origins and their influences. And you can often trace a lineage back. It's quite wonderful um, the, the, past, the pastel lineage uh, back through. It goes from Paula and Kitai back through. Um, Sickert and um, Degas and um, anyway, there is a lineage. So, so we went to an exhibition at. Um, I, I will end with this one. I probably missed out some interesting bits. Um, we went to an exhibition at the Royal at the Whitechapel, and um, of Belmer and Klossowski. We both knew the work of Belmer. We didn't know the work of Krasovsky, although we knew his brother's work, Balthus. Paula had a very complicated relationship with Balthus, but that's a subject for another occasion. Um, when we got to the White Chapel, Paul thought it was a great idea. I, Belmer was upstairs. I went to, I said, come on, let's go to Belmer. She said, no, no, I'm staying downstairs. Um, I'll join you later. About 45 minutes later, she hadn't joined me to see this extraordinary surrealist artist. And downstairs, I came back down. She was copying a drawing. And this was, I 
should have noted the years. This was one of the great turning points of her life because it, Klosowski, brother of Bautus, can consi widely considered a much inferior artist, um, drew the, did these life-size drawings and it changed the way forever Paula drew. She talked about Klosowski later and she wouldn't come up to see Bellemare. And um, so that might be, well, you're going to talk about Paula and, and, and her impact on you. And oh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that she said artists should borrow, um, steal, not borrow, well, well, which she, I she, thought was wonderful. Well, except it's so she, funny, she, isn't she, it? She was stealing that or stealing. borrowing it from um, uh, Elliot, who says really great, great writers don't, don't borrow, they, they steal. steal. They yeah, steal. I loved it. And that's, um, <laughs> So, I, I don't know, I've been a bit all over the place. Well, I am all over the place, actually. So, so I'm just in, enrolled. Um, I'll just finish by saying it's um, kind of privileged to have been Paula's partner and, and model. Being a model is a very strange, well, as I once said, it's the only way you can see Paula in office hours. <laughs> you want to see Paula, you become a model. And that's sort of what happened six months after we got together. It's not the usual story of the model having an affair with the painter. See Lucy and Freud et al. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it, it made a difference to, to the way the narrative is, of life is constructed. But I'm going to stop now. I mean, perhaps some of this will come up later. Now I'm turning into someone else with some relief um the i think we begin with um susan thank you who the if my if i was dealing kind of with macro i think it's more the three colleagues are going to speak in a more focused mac, micro way on on their relationship with paula's work and possibly with paula herself thank you Thank you. It was about 1985, 86, when I think you, Judy, said to me, there's this amazing show by this artist called Paul Arago, and that was at Edward Tota's gallery, and we were very excited by it, and we rushed around to see it. And then there were various reviews, including one by a male critic, who luckily I've forgotten his name, who said it's all just nursery painting. And that shocked me, and I thought that was a terrible remark. And then more work flowed, and there were a lot of very beautiful and interesting drawings and images, which my friend Jonathan Lehman said sometimes the grandchildren posed for, where girls played with these toys and with dogs. And I loved that as well. And after I left camp after I left the RA schools, about a year afterwards, my first child, Cosmo, was born, and I found myself in a flat in Labrook Grove in a really rough neighborhood. Um, and I'm going to show you two images from there, if I might. They're early paintings from 91. Um, and I put them up because I took my daughter, there they are, the back one, there they are. I took my daughter in a pram up to Liverpool to see the show, oh, yeah. the Tate show at Liverpool. We went away for the day. It was quite an epic journey. Pushed the buggy onto the train and arrived in Liverpool and had a really extraordinary day walking around Liverpool, looking at the imagery and thinking about her work. And then I continued working in this flat, in the studio, which was part of the configuration of the building with these children, first one, then the second one. And I decided that I'd seen women all through South America's backpacker who just looked after their children while they worked. And I thought, why must we always feel we must have childcare? Surely I can just keep on making the pictures. But it was really due to Paula that I began to imagine the paintings and to paint partly out of my imagination and partly from observation. So in this one here, there's a view there of snow falling at the backs at Labrook Grove, just near Goulburn Road, which has become enormously fashionable now. Lucy and Freud lived nearby, and um, George Melly lived around the corner. And an, uh, a, a movie star came and said, could I write down everything you say while you paint the picture? This is actually Judy Christie, and she came, she sat in the room, and she wanted me to talk about exactly what I was doing as I made the picture. Probably quoted Paula, because 
the picture was plain, just this with a plain wall. And then when she had gone, she came about once a week, made these notes. She was going to be in a film. She was going to be a, a painter in a film. She wanted to know, how does it work? So then I put in my children flying through the air because my life was turned upside down and was quite chaotic. And then the second one, there's a house fire at the top because somebody set fire to their flat um, next door, in fact. And the second one, so there's a fire blazing at the top and then um, my daughter in costume dress and this child. Later, I was invited by Paula to the studio and I went to the studio in which used to be the old Burden Davis factory. Yeah. And I was absolutely delighted. I was teaching here then, and she had all these wonderful props. She had all these things which were in the picture, which I thought perhaps she'd imagined. Wonderful things like purses and bags and a small kind of rubber pig and all these terrific things cluttered there and a great big rack of clothing. By this stage, I was running a class here called The Body Clothes. She was a major influence on me. I'd tentatively gone down that route, clothing the model each week, collaborating with the model because she said you use your model as a collaborator and that I loved I absolutely yeah. loved that when we sat in the studio so I brought in all kinds of things and I used to talk to my models and say do you mind wearing this do you wear that and I would set up poses based on opera quite often I tried yeah. to stage La Fille du Regiment in on a tiny mountain here in this very studio with somebody dressed in military dress um and I got such a lot from that visit. I later took back the members of Artes, the Latin American and Hispanic culture group that I am on the committee with, and they are curators from the V&A National Gallery, um, a range of different disciplines, and included Nigel Glendinning and the late John Elliott, Sir John Elliott. So we had this wonderful visit at night to the studio where they went in. She was making the Pillow Man series yeah. where she'd stuff all these tights with things, with bones, or all these marvelous bits and pieces. They're incredibly welcoming. Her dollies. She called them her dollies. Her dollies. <laughs> I've got a, I'll read a poem later about that. It was it was absolutely terrific. But she she changed how I felt. I'd already gone in that direction, but she really consolidated how I felt about working with models. And I still firmly believe in this way of collaborating with the model. She also said a lovely thing about how humans mostly wear clothes. For somebody like Celia Paul said, why don't you do life coach? She said, humans mostly wear clothes. And I'm interested in clothing. I'm interested in fashion, textile, and clothing history. But there were other, there were other aspects to this meeting which left me thinking about many of the pictorial ideas that she had about literature, about telling stories. I used to read whatever I was reading, I'd read to the class whether it was Hardy, right. the trumpet major, whether it was, um, what have I read recently? I've read some, read some gripping things. Oh, yes, um, yeah, the, the book that Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre loved, which is wonderful, has a kind of grand fête in the wood at night, and all these people arrive at the fête and then they disappear. Wonderful book, I remember the name shortly, but it was that fusing of literature, opera, ballet, all the things I was seeing and pushing them back into the creative world. The last thing I want to say to you all, those of you who are young, is that you can't imagine how narrow and constricting the world was in the 70s and 80s for us as young artists, how the tutors tended to be men, the students were all women, and there was this narrow genre of what you might paint. And I read in the last Victoria Miro catalogue of Vic Passmore coming by and saying, oh, you're still fiddling around with that stuff of her drawings and making it very clear to her that you could only really be an abstract painter. I think we are a really great debt, actually. Yeah, yeah. Two thanks. Very interesting what you say. Two comments only. One is an enormous subject and the other is an anecdote. The enormous subject is copying and imagination. And Paula used to say to me, you know, um, maybe it's cheating copying. Maybe you're, maybe I should be doing it out of my head. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point, I think, you, you may run out of ideas from your head and you need to, copying generates. But the important point is that copying is using your imagination. Mm. That that mm. is the mm. it's as much mm. using your and conversely, making uh, making up out of your head is not 
only out of your head. It's about your from your experience, especially childhood in that mm. case and in mm. the case of many people. And so that is a big subject. The other, the anecdote is that when King's Cross was cleaned up, um, and the 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 kind of the the rodents moved north, and some of them turned up in Paula's studio, and <laughs> and the man from um, Rentakill came over. He looked at as you did. He looked at these these wonderful um, props and clothes, yes, these, yes. which were often vintage clothes from someone in New York who said she'd donate them if Paula would put her in a picture, which Paula did, and she got the clothes. <laughs> and um, uh, and this renter cool man looked around, he said, five-star hotel, if you're a rat. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I thought that was a wonderful remark. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Now, let's let's kind of vary the... I don't think we have to do with... I mean, the... the, 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 the mom. I think Hel Helen mm. should go next. I'm just fascinated listening to your, you know, regale stories of actually meeting Paula. I think it's just incredibly, um, yeah, in incredibly inspiring to hear all of, you know, her own voice and her own thoughts and opinions. Um, but I think something you said when you were talking about when you travelled with, with her and her teaching you about looking, I think Paula was as kind of culminating what we've all been talking about is she was a great observer of people people wear clothes people you know why mm, would I paint mm, something that mm. isn't real or isn't real to me um and so there's something about her paintings that for me I remember being a very young child and actually for the first time seeing her painting in a just coming across in an art book that my sister had and being my first visceral emotion um sort of emotional reaction to it was um kind of just being disturbed and feeling that there was something very dark, very elemental, um, something, you know, deeply psychological about her work. And even at that young age, not really understanding the context of the painting, um, any of her history um, or who she really was, just seeing the painting and having that kind of immediate visceral reaction. I think that's where her work is so powerful. Um, and then much later coming to her work as an adult and, you know, having an appreciation of her history of how her childhood has affected her work and um, yeah, the expanse and diversity of her, of her work throughout her life. But yeah, that immediate visceral emotional reaction to her painting, something that I, you know, remember and I think is something really remarkable about her work. I think, you know, I'm not the first, I'm not the last writer that will engage with her paintings um, because of that nature I think writing is and poetry in particular is interested in that um yeah creating an atmosphere creating not not description um in a sense of a narrative story but of uh yeah an emotional a feeling and I think she was uh, uh, an expert in that um and yeah so I, that was my first sort of experience of her work and later coming to it now I you know I wrote a book that um as Cordy said is kind of a backdrop of her work it's named after her you know her paintings a series of um her dog women which um allowed me to kind of think about about women in society now I think as you said things have changed but um also the idea of a a body, a, a, a female body, an orientalized body, um, living in in the UK, um, and an element of the surreal, element of fantasy that I think she was engaged with. I saw an interview with her recently where she was talking about those those dolls, and she said, you know, that I'm painting, I'm painting from from them, they're real, and she says, oh, well, I pretend they are, which is basically the same thing, and is, you know, yeah. it's that she was just an incredible. I imagine an incredible person but um yeah she really got to the heart of all of these stories you know fairy tales there's something really you know allegorical about them that we take as readers and she was able to tap into that in an emotional level linking to her own childhood experiences or experiences as a woman um and so yeah so this book was kind of a way to use her work as a kind of atmosphere around which to write right into my own experiences um so yeah, and you know, I just envy all of your real life experiences with her and and um, 
yeah, I'd just like to hear more really from you guys. <laughs> we'll read your poem a bit later, perhaps. Mm. I, I just want to pick up on one thing that was, if you will, the most interesting Druin's account. Um, the dark side of Paula's imaginings. Uh, she had, the folklore she most adored was Portuguese, which is the grimmest, darkest in, yeah. in any in the world. Mm -hmm. And she spent, she got a scholarship from the Gulbenkian. And then she spent six months mm -hmm. at, at the British Museum study, studying folklore. I mean, she, told, she loved to tell the story of the woodman who's in his with his family in the forest and he's and they're starving and he said i've got we've got a, there is a solution we cut off one breast and you feed us feed us tonight mm -hmm. um feed us and the children so we'll have a meal so that's what happens then the next night cut off the other breast and then is the next day his, his wife said to him what do we need to do now he said we eat the children it's it's a very dark dark story and but uh, paulus of course chip had a great sense of humor <laughs> but about that that kind of I, i'm not one could possibly but it would be a vain effort to psychoanalyze try and explore but uh, she had this balance she had the sort of the yin and yang it, there was this cheerfulness and this dark dark but we all have both within us but she she brought them out. So, Julie. Yeah. If you could just bring up my pictures. I've taken a very random, really random selection of, of paintings. Um, if you could just flick through them and then maybe go back just to give you an idea of, of uh -huh. what I will touch upon. And as I say, they are random drawing and painting. I think, yes. So, we can start with that in a way, just to be on the screen. Um, I want to just begin by quoting something I heard Lubina Hamid say in terms of the artist's relationship to history. And I think I can then go on from there. What the artist can do, um, what the artist can do, the historian can't. The artist can take lessons from the past and turn it to shift the future or reparation. Now, I think this fed beautifully into my thinking about Paula's work because it can be said that she, um, what Paula achieved in relationship to her legacy for women, for example, I think immediately about the intersection of politics and feminism, which was the changing of the abortion laws. It, it affected change in the way that uh, I think Labina Hamid had in mind when she was talking about the possibility of something visual being as potent and more so perhaps than someone reading many papers and books of history. And that resonated with me because I've always had a great interest in history, in books, in reading. And this is where Paula initially really, I felt talking of enabling large <coughs> scenes such as changing abortion law and violence towards women in her later tremendous series of pastels addressing this and in her own work relating to being an analyse in psycho, her own psychoanalysis, her Jungian psychoanalysis, it freed me to allow myself my dual passion of reading widely and painting and how the books very often are my source of my work. Rather than immerse myself historically, talking about my own process in art history, the minutiae, the history, which I find as a dyslexic person sometimes quite overwhelming. My passion for reading novels from anywhere, history, even science papers, whatever it is, they kick off my ideas. And because we're talking about literature, I also 
want to just touch initially before we go on to look at more. If we could just go back, please. Just to the first one. And I'll be as brief as, as possible. And there's a, the one of the child in the garden. Seems to have disappeared off the loop. Well, okay. well, well, there it is. I have Sue touched upon the constriction of our art education in the 70s. It was so male dominated, and to the point that at Camberwell, there was a prescripted notion of what the process of painting should be. It should be suffering. You must suffer for your art, you must be anguished. And somehow that was too close to the bone for me. I'd lost my mother as a teenager and I wanted to escape the language into my imagination. And I started a series of paintings, imagining myself as a child to come to grips in relationship to analysis I was having at the time to regain a sense of self, but wasn't one that was beset within this, the, the totality of darkness. I wanted my light back. And I enjoyed what you talked about, the light and the dark, which in reading at the time I was a student, Dostoevsky, you realise we all have the capable, capability of dark light. And this is a, a small painting of a series I began called Myself Remembered. So we can then go on. And then talking of literature, one of the poets who have influenced me enormously in my work Coleridge. is Coleridge. <laughs> because the fantasy of <laughs> Kubla Khan, the pain, the poem which I return to again and again is the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And I've done many, many reincarnations, reincarnations of this painting and interpreted in terms of my own history, which is that my parents were refugees from Nazi Germany. And the way they brought us up was to be in total empathy with those who journey, who flee for whatever reason and to make sure we see them as humanized and not numbers. And so I began, if you could just go back. So I began this series, this isn't the first one. The first one was a large, a 10 foot by six triptych, which I actually called the rhyme of the ancient mariner. But here, this is something more opaque in which many, many years later, I'm still using imagery and which is of course the albatross. And it's a huge painting. It's um, six foot across by four, and underneath they're small panels with oblique reference to allegory, which again, I adored in, in Paula's work, the way she used allegory to stand for so much more than the thing in itself. And this particular painting was started, A, when my brother died, and for some reason, I went to the albatross into my studio, and the first thing I painted was the albatross, and then, at the same time, I was reading in the press about this man who would fled um, an African, I'm sorry, I don't know the country in Africa, and he'd held on to the cargo wheels, of a, uh, the wheels of a cargo plane, and he fell to earth and died, obviously, into some, but he, he came to earth, and I imagined it in a garden, so that there are images of my garden, very small little panel painters, which I joined up in the end, to make it refer to something more than itself. Because I like my paintings to, for myself to have a motivation for the reason of wanting to paint them. But then once they're out there in the world, I like them to have a wider meaning so people can come to them as Paula's narratives do for me and always did do from our very first visit to the Edward Tota Gallery where her early paintings, which I felt very much were about symbols of the dark and the light within her. And I was just starting analysis then. And that resonated with me so powerfully. And I thought painting doesn't have to be about suffering and from observation only. So after I left Camberwell and the Royal Academy Schools, I started to mine my memory. And my memory is what, and literature and music and so much more informs the starting point of a picture. And then when I need references to nature, I use a model, I go into the garden, I go wherever I might need to do to do the drawing. And I work from memory 
and I work in a kind of netherland between memory, reality, history, books, music. And I have to say that Paula Rego's paintings gave me permission to do that, to reach into subject matter that mattered to me that wasn't in the studio, politics in particular, history, and my love of reading. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in what you had to say. And your, your final remark uh, applies to me as well. I mean, she gave, I was always a bit cautious watching, watching out in case I went a bit too far. And um, I read her when I was working on, on my book about being her model, which I read to her. And I would occasionally stop and say, don't you think I've gone a bit too far? Mm -hmm. And she said, you haven't gone far enough. Mm -hmm. Go for it. She, she, and forgive, my, forgive a joke I made, but I patented it, patented it. I said, the reason you have so many exhibitions is that you have so few inhibitions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so that's... There's one last thing I'd like to say about her work, and that's that she brought that into the contemporary culture, the lives of the female saints. Yes. And she based work quite often on female saints mm. and explored the paintings of people like Ribera, yeah. which were deeply unfashionable. You couldn't have mentioned Ribera at Campbell. There's no, no, no way. No. You there could were, never there have. Two artists. That's right. North German and Northern Renaissance. <laughs> no way. And <laughs> Spanish Renaissance. Yeah, well, I always love this. No way. Well, I love the Spanish paintings. Yeah. I remember the head of painting said, Boy, oh, very patchy, very yeah. patchy. And I and remember it... the head of painting saying to me, German paintings, no, no, northern Italy is all about design. <laughs> and and in it's it's just colour in Germany. And I thought, it's not what I think. But you it was very inhibiting to voice an opposition at that point. It was something that quietly chugged away at the back of my mind. She borrowed them and she brought them back to life and reinvigorated them. So often figures in paintings, for example, Crevelli's Garden, are based on these female saints. I love that Crevelli's Garden series and any of my students who are in this room or online who are with me on Friday nights know that I used to take them all down into the restaurant where it was a bit forgotten. It was, oh, what's this? And I'd tell them all about it and talk them through it. And we'd been looking at Crevelli earlier on. See, Crevelli is another painter that oh, Campbell said, I just don't, don't look at that. that. Don't. She completely she brought him back into such prominence that there was for a long time a room in the Sainsbury wing of Crevelli's, right. which I loved. And then the Icon Gallery had, they borrowed a whole lot. They put them in this contemporary gallery up in Birmingham and was the most gorgeous display. They took them out of their frames, put them on white walls, and they just became contemporary art. That's because of Paula. Yeah. That's Paula. Well, there's a campaign. The, the, the pictures, the, the Crivelli, which were in the Sainsbury Wing, that are now on show in this wonderful mini exhibition. It's a campaign, I think, partly led by former, former um, employees of the National Gallery, so they can do what they like. And they want the picture, pictures to be in the gallery. Yeah. They don't have to be safe yeah. and dead. Well, as sad as she is, but the they would normally belong in the Tate. As we know, the Tate picks up where the National Gallery stops. But they they were done for the National Gallery while she was that's right. And uh, while she was the first, I think the first artist in residence, possibly the second first, I think. And um this question, she adored Mannerists and Baroque. Mm, we, mm. we were in um, Umbria on the one year we went on the on the Piero della Francesca trail. Now that was for me because I adore Piero, and she has her reservations um, because I, I, I and I was reading this book called Destroy, Détruire la Peinture, a, a brilliant and difficult book. Uh, Détruire la Peinture, destroy painting, was what Poussin said of Caravaggio, the great, great Poussin, whom I infinitely prefer to Caravaggio, and Paula, exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. The great Poussin said, you know, Caravaggio came, was sent to this planet to destroy painting. That's kind of a strong, those are strong words, <laughs> but he felt threatened. And and I, people, my taste is like uh, um, Piero, Poussin, 
Hopper Baltus, the old the older brother of Prososky, if you remember. Those and she, and then she read a book I gave her by a French poet whom I've translated, and who one of whose texts she did the most wonderful prints, uh, the planche called Curved Planks. She read this book and she said, well, I, I can see where your taste in painting comes from. <laughs> and it was true. That was how I was formed. But I, I did learn to, one and once we were in Italy, um, in fact, on, on the Piero Trail, and our host in Arezzo said, um, he, he was a professor at Goldsmith, but he lived part of the year in Arezzo. He said, I don't know if he had an intuition. He said to Paula, would you like to see a Rosso Fiorentino picture? Now, Rosso Fiorentino was one of the great mannerists. Mm. Um, and um, she said, yes, please, almost get me away from out of here. <laughs> and it was a scandal, a disgrace. <laughs> she had that attitude sort of to, to my beloved Piero. But anyway, she went and was spent a long time in front, in front of the... Um, um, in front of the, the, the Rosso Fiorentino. So how are we doing for time, um, somebody? Well, I think in a moment it'd be wonderful to... Kind of Whack it up and have questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like, I would like to read a poem and yeah. um, Helen... I can read off, yeah. Which, who, who goes first? I don't mind. <laughs> you go first. Yeah. You, you read, read yeah. your dog, yeah. you can read your dog woman. Then, I will read... Um, another one. I was thinking about reading a couple of poems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Please do, um, please do. I think the first poem is more clearly ekphrastic. I think that from the from the pamphlet. Um, so this is this is the title poem called Dog Woman, and yeah, as I said, the whole collection is kind of um, wrapped wrapped around this work. But this is the kind of more explicitly associated poem with Paul Rigo series of paintings. Um, so this is called Dog Woman. The artist came out howling and never stopped. There are her memories. There are her muscular women. Beaten back hair. Kinetic jaws. Watch out for their ruin. They howl too, flicking ticks from their rumps. Dresses flung up. They can hold and cut and salvage as well as dance. Their backs, tremendous bows. Oh, and their knees are glorious. They ride horses, eat lettuce have abortions on leather sofas, cradling soft toys in their groins. They wear fierce dark oil to keep warm, sleep as peacefully as dogs tucked up on their owner's coats. Um, okay, and then I think I might end on a slightly newer poem um, that, yeah, relates to, I think some of the themes we were talking about. Um, and this is a poem about related to my mother and also some thinking about how we inherit more than just our physical attributes um illness from our our ancestors from our families um but stories from their histories um and particularly through the maternal line how that affects how that affects us um and this poem is called good to soft which is a description of the ground my mum is very much into horse racing or betting on horses mm -hmm. and um it describes how much how soft the, the soil is that the horses are racing on um and that depends on how much rain has fallen how malleable it is which horses are going to do better based on their weight class and things like that so it's kind of a fertile metaphor for for these themes so this is called good to soft and i'll just read this and then mother's hair tends to thin around the temples despite normal thyroid function She's placed two pounds each way on a horse, have a go-go, picking her winner partly because of the name, but mainly because of the horse's birth line, the quality of the soil that day, the going good to soft. Here's to the good going soft as we lose each other in the supermarket cold section, as we lose our function as women, queuing on the hospital floor, dreams like handbags slipping off the shoulder into mascarpone air, wrong cells spewing in the breast lumps shaped like boats. Manifest cargo in our bras. Tissue surrounds like rivers, lined with our father's fish. Generations, past, present, apoptotic. The genetics of want hang by the bedside table where she last set down her glasses. The eyesight weakens with time, like food stains crusting on the wall. Mine will go soon enough. 
as we've both stared longingly at this future from a TV screen built into the backside of house, a dull end of tributary, irises clouded with milk, leading us to you, you who separated animal from tooth. Soft to the good, our girlishness degrades with cursive cousins, aunts, distant half-fathers, gambling in sunnier districts, not home long enough to place mother's duck in the bathtub. She remembers holding his hand at the races, watching her first winner rush the finish line, won by a nose. We love our fathers dearly. The ticket must have burned, violent in her hand. Check and check again. She can't win on fast ground. Look at her weight class, look at those legs. And I say I can't bear to watch the horses crumple like knickers to be put down on the side of the track. She says, of course you can. Don't be so sentimental when it comes to winning. Don't go and spoil this glorious good Sunday when ancestors lived freely kept and we live without contract. Going the going. I peel like softest mud. They washed red cells in the river. I try vinegar and various oils, but I've learned blood resists. Clumped red stuck around the wound like cake crumbs. The genes that inherit this face are tangential and I have no idea what my nose says about me whether my mother, kneading it with her fingers into an arch, had any lasting effect. Well, I do mm -hmm. look forward to reading that. <laughs> in your next book or in a magazine, I hope you can read it. Um, I just want to read a poem. Um, if it's here. I will be disappointed if it isn't. Um, here it is. It's called, indeed, Paula's Studio and Her Dollies. And it, I've written over the 25 years a number of poems for her, but only one since she died. This was the last one I wrote in her lifetime, and she would occasionally ask for it during our evening sessions. And, and mostly I chose the poems because... We practically always read Kubla Khan almost every night. Um, and she she had a kind of running commentary on it, which used to make me laugh. I used to have to stop reading them. Um, so, Paula's studio and her dollies. Sacred, and it has a, 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 a phrase from uh, Don Giovanni, and the arm compagnie belle. Section one Sacred space like a bedroom entered by few. We human models are accessory and accessory. We survive a little older like the artist and the homemade dollies survive. They obey in working hours the rules of the game. They keep their secrets. Two, after reading a few pages of Daphne du Maurier's Bramwell Bronte, four miles away, Paula sleeps. Around midnight, Sorcery rules okay in the studio. Paula's dollies unravel their inner human, reveal their souls, draw lots for who does what, to whom, and, and to whom. Third, third and final section. Free at last, they party. They act out Kokoshka, the heading Alma, his silent dolly. And now, ambitious like Paula, the intriguers put on their style and perform Don Giovanni. You masqueraders, why are you calling? Okay, so that, um, I think we we can do whatever comes next. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, over to you. Yeah. I could not say I had it to see you. you love that. Thank you so much to you all for an incredibly enlivening and, and really moving conversation. We really want to hear all of your insights from different perspectives. Um, we've got a little bit of time now for questions um, and some thoughts that you'd like to raise in the audience. And hopefully we can also reach those online as well. If, uh, um, if you'd like to put uh, your questions in the Q&A or listening uh, by live stream. Um, I wonder, I just one thought perhaps before we open up. I I was really interested in how you know how poetry became such a reference point 
all of you in different ways. And the relationship between um, reading alone internally or internalizing poems, um, reading silently, and being read to you, the, the very different kind of intimacy of being read to you. I mean, we've just you know, had this wonderful experience of you both reading your poems. And Susan, you were talking about, I think, reading, I think maybe perhaps it was Hardy, maybe not his poetry, but in, in the studio. And, and Le Grand Merle, as the, the, the ah, book okay. I was trying oh, to remember. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So yeah. I just wonder if that, about that relationship between the two and whether something particular happened to, for you, perhaps, Anthony, when reading before the, whether something very, there's something very different about hearing the rhythms of poetry. Well, reading. Reading poetry aloud, it, uh, which is commonplace in in novels one reads of the past, it's kind of unusual activity these days. And um, and the one, especially read, the ones I read regularly, um, I would try and vary the the interpretation, if you like. And um, so I'd say Keats. Elliot, um, Browning, Matthew Arnold, uh, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare, yes, yes, yes. The, I did occasionally, when we read on the phone, I would, um, if she was having trouble sleeping, I would try, I would choose a, a boring poem. <laughs> because the, the non-boring poems would wake you up not so easy to sleep so and i find some dreadful victorian narrative poem like so rub and rustum of matthew arnold which, and that that was quite good at, it nearly put me to sleep and i i mean and i was reading it but i mean though to be fair to matthew arnold we we often read the dover beach which she loved and, and knew, knew and joined in. It, it is so remarkable that she went to an English school and had a good English teacher who, who, who made people, made the children learn poems off by heart. And that it was actually inevitable that if she was going to leave Portugal with her Anglophile Democrat father to get away from a fascist regime, to mm -hmm. come to London. Mm -hmm. and it, my, her mother was more of a Francophile. But it was good that she it was good for me that she came to London and um and and retained the memory of and and then learnt off by heart new ones that she hadn't learned at school. Much better memory than I had for, for poetry. So it's it's like fantastic, really. Can I just say that when I read to the students in the class during my class, that the drawings change. Mm -hmm. It's really like a kind of magic How do you to mean read. The drawings change? Well, you well, read poem? Yeah, while I'm reading, I would read long pieces. I've been reading um, Carlo Levy's amazing book, Christ Stop the Eberly, to my students, actually in the National Gallery. But what happens is that everybody's brain just changes. You change. You, you get really caught up in this narrative. And the drawings, the model would be posed in a way which would relate to the story. The drawings do change. It's really interesting. And it's like a form of magic. It wouldn't yeah. work the same way if you read prose. It it's better. It works better with poetry, I you assume. Said, you, so that, well, I wasn't reading poetry. I was reading prose. I was reading you were reading Yeah, prose. I was reading prose. That's why I said, described that scene in Le Grand Mur where there was a, a oh, fit okay. in the dark. Yeah. It's very beautiful, incredibly beautiful. But... The, the drawings did change and people did find it extraordinary. Some people said they couldn't hear it or they had hearing problems or, you know, didn't suit everybody, but it was very interesting. Did enliven the room. Yes, I have, talking about teaching, um, because my, my even my portraits, they are, I see my paintings as narrative paintings. And in the classes I've taught here, one in particular, which I taught at its inception of, and helped think of the idea with a lovely woman who worked at here at one point um, drawing the unexpected the whole premise of my class was that nobody would know what we were going to draw until they arrived and it had to turn into narrative drawing and two instances stick out in particular one was when I asked some actors I knew to do improvisation each 45 minutes 
another story would be acted out and they'd be moving all the time acting as props and the drawings were superb because they had to move not mm. only in mm. time with the movement mm. but with the narrative in terms of its conception what is this narrative and another that stands out is when we got animal actors to bring in um a donkey at one point and again the drawings that came out of that manges all sorts of things mm. the stories unfolded mm. because mm. people had to find a way in that wasn't the expected and it's for me in my practice it's always looking outside the box what do you see in the spaces not in the subject what allows you in that hasn't been done before in your way because it's been done a hundred times and more and better than I could ever do mm. in other ways it's about finding a voice and I think all of love of literature and your poems and what you've spoken of is about a voice that can echo into many resonances, touch on many lives and subject matter, and even affect change. And even animating, it will really animating an image. Mm -hmm. uh, Helen, yeah. uh, what I want to ask, just want to ask you, you, is there any interesting dialectical feedback between your day job and your poetry. It wasn't the last part. Well, it, was the, it wasn't the, the last answer, part. The answer is the last yes. Part the the last part. That's fantastic. But have you got some... Um, I'm not sure if in the introduction... I'm, like, I'm not giving away. Did mm, you mention yeah, that, yeah, Helen, yeah, yeah. Uh, as you know, is a, is a GP? So I'm not a GP, but I work in a Sorry, hospital. Sorry, you work okay. in one of the hospitals, yes. Um, so yeah, I've been a doctor for a few years now, and I have never written... Um, anything related to medicine before I think particularly dog women was you know very separate to me and I, I saw them as very separate worlds um, and we were talking earlier about the kind of medical um, jargon but yeah kind of lexicon that I only use at work and is very um, bizarre and um, othering I think in other contexts and it's a way that we talk about the body it's a way we talk about illness it's the way we talk about um you know how we manage all of these these ideas which are actually just human experiences that we kind of categorize into these symptoms um and so yeah i think before i felt they were quite separate um but actually now in this new work i am i'm thinking a little bit more about that and how how that um can be played with the idea of yeah different lexicon um how some words can be alienating how Often medical language has really interesting etymologies, really interesting roots, mm, um, mm. how that can kind of um, expand the way we think about uh, our own bodies, um, but also how, yeah, reveals, it's very revealing the way we describe, um, and in medicine, it's very specific. Um, you, you aim for specificity, you aim for being as certain as you can and um, in what you're describing, what you're seeing. Um, and so again, I think there are a lot of similarities between writing and, and medicine, actually, the way you you analyze, you observe um, with different intentions, obviously. Um, so yeah, so it's something I'm thinking about, but they don't, I think initially didn't naturally coincide for me, but now perhaps they will begin to slightly merge with each other, but um, yeah, I often find when I come across medical jargon in poetry, it can be quite alienating for an audience. And I, I'm kind of <laughs> trying to interrogate that a little bit because, um, yeah, having a, a poem that's completely full of um, terminology is not not so helpful in some respects, unless you're intending to, you know, for a reason. So, yeah, about intentionality and, um, yeah, yeah. Don't forget those great doctors who wrote, you know, mm, people. Yes, yeah. It's, you know, there's a whole stream stream of that exactly. that keeps, yeah. yeah. And, and, just and even something like more, I just read recently, exactly. Yeah. I was yeah. given a book in a hotel and mm. he was a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Rabelais. Yeah. 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 I just read it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sorry, I'm a bit dazzled by the light. So please, yeah, brilliant. Thank it, you. This is a kind of observation um, which links with Paula Rago's connection with her visit to opera. 
And this I went to a production of um, Peter Grimes by Benjamin Britten, the Royal Shakespeare, or the ENO, a couple of weeks ago, where it seemed to me there's a very overt reference in the, in the staging, in the costume staging, to Paul Arago. I don't know if anybody saw the production. And Peter Grimes did an old production of him. I think Royal Opera House did it some time ago, and I don't know if they did this, but um, I don't know, is it, is, are you aware of this in the in, in this production? Well, it seems to me very obvious. So if you know the opera, there's these two women who are euphemistically called the nieces, who are really mm. Mm. And they were holding dollies, some very, very oh. small Arago dollies. Oh. And there was also a scene later on when there was a, a dance in the um, in the borough, which was so like that picture that you just showed of the dancing, it's kind of slightly robotic. Um, and the costumes are just the same, they're all from the 1950s costumes. And, you know, I just immediately thought, this is Paul Arago. Um, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was. Yeah. But there's lots of borrowing in the opera, because I go regularly, I didn't see that I production. Actually, I saw that production. Yeah, yeah. I did, and I, I actually thought the beach scene was also very reminiscent of that painting. Of the dance. Of the dance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just thought it was rather yeah. exciting. That but I saw it a while ago. Mm. And our painters that she loved, and of course, Crabbe was mm. uh, the poem, uh, the, the poet Crabbe's work, the borough, was what kind of inspired mm. the opera to put in a commentary. She, she, she adored opera for him. Her taste was um, narrow. It, it perhaps is um, essentially she loved the um, Verdi, Bellini, you know, mm. the, 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 the canon, the mm. um, and but pushed in at uh, Yanufa, she actually painted, you know, she adored Jan Arcek, so she was getting. I'm not quite sure that the contemporary music, well, I know the contemporary music wasn't her scene, she would have been delighted that that a uh, production of Peter Grimes drew on her on her imagery. And um, she was asked to do the costumes for an, an, an opera, but said no. I, I think purely a question of time and priorities, mm, mm. Not, not because it wouldn't have been mm. fun and interesting. Mm. So that that's really... Uh, is it still on? I must go and see yeah, it. No, I went to the last oh. Oh. It'll be yeah. revived. It'll probably be revived. Yeah. Don't miss it. Yeah. I'd like also to recommend. Um, Paul has got two shows on at the moment in London. Um, I think uh, Victoria Miro, her paintings of the nineteen eighties, which mm. are kind of mm. have been neglected and are very wonderful, and um, and that's on for another two or three weeks. And at the National Gallery, mm. the the showing of Paula's work and Crivelli. And, and another, Florence, and another Florence. exhibition, which she would be delighted that I suggest, say, do go and see the Kitai exhibition at Piano Nobile in Holland Park. Mm -hmm. It is a glorious and wonderful, unexpected exhibition um, by this very great painter. David Hockney said he owed everything to Kitai. And Paula actually once said, I would like to be Kitai. <laughs> Her husband said, don't be silly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a kind of way of saying how important and powerful his his presence was um, in among among art students. Of course, he was slightly yeah. older than the other students. He it was a, important. It was important. He had a power yeah. of mm. personality, mm. intellect. Yeah. He, mm. Very, a very remarkable. Um, well, he and Hockney at the Royal College are said to have paint, discussed how you ought to paint about all the things that interest you, make yeah. paintings about vegetarianism was the one oh. piece that came up. I remember from that conversation being rather amused by that and rather delighted. I can't, but words either of them are vegetarian. I, I, I don't know. But it's, just, it's just a really nice, in that, in that austere... I'm going to move mouth again. In that austere climate. Anyone who'd like to raise a hand there? Hello, mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask about like the nature of space. If you could talk a bit about the different types of space that she gets to, because there's the space in the Victoria Mirror show, and then this, which is one of the different types of space, and then other types of space in the Castle Warriors, and then within the sculptural work. So, like how she paints sculpture, what that kind of space means, how that relates to the other types of space. I don't know, it's quite a painting question. No, that's right. <laughs> the painters? <laughs> well, 
for myself, the early work, I can I haven't seen the show yet at Victoria Miro, but it's a very shallow space. And yet within the shallow space on the picture plane, there are lots of perspectival stories going on. I, you know, I'm thinking of one image of a, I think there's a, a woman with, is she stuffing a bear's mouth? Oh, yeah. And although I haven't seen this particular <laughs> reincarnation of, of it showing, I remember it, and it, it's a very actual space, a physically imagined three-dimensional space. And yet when you stand back, you get a different space. You get the, the flat painting. And I think it's, it's a very pictorial, for me, image. I can just refer to that one painting, but you might have um, something to say about other yeah. images. Well, yeah, there are paintings that I particularly love, like Policeman's Daughter of 1987, where it's an acrylic where the policeman's daughter is polishing a boot and you get action taking place immediately before you, but quite often you get a window mm -hmm. and then another space which leads, there's another one of a cadet lead, saying a farewell to one in a red hat and there's a, there's a hilltop town way up in the distance. So you have an immediate sense of the action, it's quite theatrical actually, of the action taking place right here and then suddenly you are opened up with a, with a, long, a long view. But sometimes that doesn't happen at all. There aren't the long views. And I'm thinking of an angel from 1991, which I particularly love, which looks like a self-portrait where I think Paul is in a silver dress brandishing a kind of sword. Mm -hmm. And it's pastel. It was in Dan and Dulwich picture going up. Absolutely lovely. Laser picture. from 91. What? Yes. No. And, and the chief, her chief model and studio assistant looked very like Paula. That's, which is that, why it, yes. it, it was what it's well known and that's why Paula had the, the great bonus of being able to, as it were to paint herself and not paint herself mm -hmm. because Leela looks like her. Leela that's right that's right yeah it, it's it's a good question because then there are the outdoor pictures like the dance mm -hmm. where there's infinite space mm -hmm. but I think they're very I always thought especially after going to the studio that they were very much about the theatre, and they probably owe quite a lot yeah, to the opera. Very. Because in the opera, you often get mm -hmm. space, really shallow space, like the recent Don Giovanni, which mm -hmm. still goes on at the opera house. It's wonderful. Luke Hall did the lighting. His wife was in my class for quite a long time. They live in New Zealand, but he lit it, and he had, it has all this drawing, and has this very shallow space, and quite rago dresses, actually, great big dresses with splodges of colour, like stains on them to imply flaws in character, no doubt. But the the space is really shallow. Honestly, sometimes it's about this deep with Leporello seeing on set from here to here, and then suddenly it, the set revolves and it becomes really big and it takes place on several different levels. So you would have Donna Anna up the top. They really are Rago dresses, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I really recommend seeing that because the drawing by Luke Hall is stunning. And it's actually all computerized. It's all completely computerised and it's all about drawing. And in fact, it's what a packing you, thing, isn't it? It is. It's, and, packing, and it's, touching. it's It's amazing. And that's something I see very much in her work. And it yeah. pertains to the answer I just highlighted with that one painting. It's like a, a proscenium arch. It's a yes. stage. It reminds yeah. me of Signorelli, yeah. Beckman. They're yeah. all on a stage. Yeah, on a stage. And referencing Shakespeare to... You know, worth. She I love Beckman. that, and I like the fact I, I that one it. of you mentioned Peter Grimes mm -hmm. and that production there because I think that leads us very neatly to this Don Giovanni at the Royal Opera House, which is it will be revived, and it's breathtaking. But you, if you're in the cheap seats, I was the first night. You don't really see the whole stage. You need to see the whole stage. Yeah, <laughs> that sense of staging. Did you feel as a model kind of inhabiting different the stage? Characters and no, no stage not or really. I, 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 I used yeah. to I used to pretend that it was um, method acting. Ah, right. So I would duly read the read the book and try and imagine I was Laurence Olivier. And, really and, and, but, 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 and, and but really, you're just keeping still and, yeah. and the crick in the neck. Yeah. Well, she loved yeah. loved me when my head was slightly turned mm. but that it's not natural mm. to pose no well, it's not is it but no. it's something it's a privilege in in the circumstances in the personal circumstances and to watch and to learn mm. how, how it's done 
from within. Or to some, I mean, not I couldn't go up and do it myself, but uh, of course. But I just small things like um, how long she looks at the model and then goes back to the picture, mm -hmm. and I sort of tried to remember afterwards and write about that. Mm -hmm. The the um, yeah. you can move a bit if if she's not looking at you. The mm -hmm. woe betide yeah. if you if you are one inch. Oh, so she's quite strict about movement. Very strict, ah. hugely strict. Really, and um, uh, and I mean the next at the end of the day um, there would be chalk. She put chalk marks. Oh, mark your feet for the feet. Mm -hmm. mark, oh, okay. Mark feet. Oh, oh, yeah. Good. Very That's good. kind of very strict. Yeah. Yeah, so she's the kind of like the ringmaster, really, isn't she? Well, yeah, that's one of the yes, uh, ringmaster. Ringmaster, that, director, because I was that's another, when you yeah. reference the unnatural pose, she's staging you. Yes, you're totally, acting. totally staging. Yeah, you're I mean, I was going to, one picture, the, the most difficult pose of all, it was, a, it was laugh, it was funny as well. There was a picture called um, Come Into the Inn Miranda, some of you may know. Yes, yes, the, no, the, yes, the yes, Belloc poem, yes, 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 giving your age away. <laughs> Not many people know Belloc now, but um, and she did a picture of of so loosely related to the painting. No one would guess, and it involved at the bottom most part of the painting. I was underneath Leela. It was about the least sexy and erotic moment of my life and hers. You know, it was not the. It was just hot and sweaty, and we just had to keep still as this sort of and you couple. Had to in a, How I think long we may have been in a tomb. Oh, it, well, well, we had to do it for as long as it took. So, and then this poet, whom you know, know from New Zealand, the poet he, poet laureate of New Zealand, and his wife, who. Are, Good, she just died. They're good friends of mine. They came to the studio and asked Paula what she was working on, and she said, um, "Miranda, the Belloc's Miranda poem." At this point, the, they stood to attention and recited the whole poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that, was, that was <laughs> utterly amazing. And uh, there isn't probably time. He he wrote he wrote a poem about uh, about that occasion. So it's kind of gone full circle. Terrific. It's ended up in his. Terrific. In his in his latest book of poems, so <laughs> yeah. Time for one more question. I don't know if there are any better questions on the live stream that you can. There's one down the end, down the back. A lot of the it's yeah, lot lot. Of thanks, Jeff, on the panel. Um, the well, the question for Helen actually, just to ask how you came across Rego initially, mm -hmm. uh, what your first introduction was. Um, so yeah, I guess it was that first painting that I saw when I was younger, and then I guess as an adult, um, much yeah, much later, um, I remember watching Secret and Sto Secrets and Stories, the documentary her son made about her mm. life, and that was really impactful. Um, but yeah, that early memory of, of yeah as a child, um, and then yeah, much later coming to learning a little bit more about her life in that documentary was really revealing. And yeah, seeing her studio space and how she used um, props and you know built these built these things. And yeah, I think that was probably as an adult more my experience. Yeah. There was a question somebody Maybe was there one last question in the room, and then we. Down the back, down the back. Yeah, I can see a waving hand. Yeah. I mean, my question about how Paula takes figures, because I find something quite peculiar about them in idiots and crafty style. And it's kind of, I find it compelling, but also odd. And I'm going to the new guys to kind of understand it a bit. And they're always so thick set and solid, and kind of the heads are always quite big. And you can't imagine kind of jumping or like doing a high jump or hurdling. And and I, I find it. Compelling, but also distant to me a little bit from her work. So I was wondering if there any reason you thought about why she often takes figures like that and, and what how she might have got there and, and what you think the effect of it is, if you agree with what I'm saying. I've, I've got a, an immediate reaction is that they're stage sets, they're stories, mm. they're, pic, they're pictorial affect of, of storytelling, they're staged. And for me, that gives them the solidity the permanence in the way that the folk stories, folk tales and myths transcend time. They're there, they change. We bring, each generation brings a changing interpretation, but they're solid, they're in the canon. And I, and I see that kind of representation as part of that staging myself. Mm. 
Didn't she want them to be tough? Don't you think she really wanted yes, them to be? Yes, definitely. Tough female the, the, protagonists. Yes, I do think that as well. And a lot of the poses are are really strong, very, very strong. Yes. Um, and accentuated by the soft dolls that kind of yeah, lay around, yeah. limpid. Yeah. It's a it's a good question. I think well, the one thing we didn't really talk about much is the impact of of the dictatorships because yes. there was the long and really terrible dictatorship of General Franco in Spain, which she would have been very sensitive as a child, and then the, of course, growing up in Salazar's dictatorship. So impossible for us to imagine what that's like. The only thing I can to say to you is that the daughter of a Spanish writer lived with us for many years, and she told us once that she, her mother could not leave Spain without her, her husband authorising a passport and giving permission to travel. And you couldn't buy art books in Barcelona during General Franco's regime, not even an art book. You know, it's, those are just two examples of the kind of punitive world that she, you could say she almost escaped into the English yes. literary canon, the poems, the writing, the, the school, with the her, language. Her father insisting, sending her to England. Mm. You, the, yeah. that Portugal is no place for anybody, but especially not for a woman. Woman, I mean. Oh, I think that's right. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's. But you know, there's a wonderful connection. Can I just tell? Yes, uh, no, it only came to me the other day. Um, I was watching for the um, countless times um, Casablanca, mm. and it suddenly I looked up. The film was made in 1942, and if you may remember. Um, the names that the two characters are named, not Rick, he stays behind. Uh, it's the name, uh, Laszlo and, and the woman, they go to Lisbon. That's the plane right. end, the film That's ends right. with a plane going to Lisbon. Now, in 1942, Paula was tap dancing at the casino in, in Storil. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and I suddenly <laughs> thought to myself, they, was, they, they are on their way to Lisbon. They're yeah. not going to be working in the resistance all the time. They'll be they'll pop into the tap dancing. Tap, they'll <laughs> see, they will see Paula tap dancing. She was taught to dance by the uh, because remember Portugal was neutral, mm. so it wasn't like hobnobbing with mm. the enemy because the, the the officially neutral though secretly he leaned towards England mm. sensibly enough, and um, so the, in the audience at the casino were people, Nazis and British and French, all kinds of people. And she was taught to tap dance by a woman called Miss Cook, who, who, is, who Paula thinks without any evidence was a spy, but she might well have been a spy as well. And it sort of, it kind of brought everything full circle, but two fictional characters that watched, watched Paula <laughs> in, her, in, her, in whatever, Costume. Yeah. Costume. Yes, she yeah. was she was seven and she did it for, for a number of years. That's lovely. So that, you. that you you know this was not you you can't say it was it, it was resistance. You you can't really call it um the opposite either. It was a different it wasn't, you know, anyway, that's not that's a big subject, the question of, of oh. collaboration and resistance, and it doesn't apply. She her father was able to fly to England during the war. He was probably secretly a part of the of the war effort. Let's say mm. for another conversation. Another conversation. Another conversation. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't think we'd end with Paul really to tap that song. Well, it's really that's lovely really way to end. end. Yeah. Thank you, and just to thank yeah. you again, this wonderful panel, our speakers. Uh, it's been a really brilliant conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.